Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Cagle, and I'd like to thank you for choosing orthopedic specialist for your upcoming knee replacement surgery. We specialize in the very best of knee replacement surgery here at Orthopedic Specialist. I would also like to say thank you for taking the time to watch this video to go over your upcoming knee replacement with this reference guide. This is designed to help you navigate the upcoming few weeks before surgery and after surgery to make this as seamless and as excellent as possible. So the first few pages of the reference guide are the table of contents. This is followed by a, a basic welcoming statement. And I'd like to begin first by talking about page two, the purpose of the notebook. So again, this is an overview and it's a guide to help you get through your knee replacement. I recommend that you read this several times before going through the knee replacement so just you can better understand the whole process. Please read this page and then we get to page three. There are several things on here I'd like to discuss with you. First, the role of the surgery scheduler. Now, this person focuses to help you get through this process as seamless as possible. They will help order the CT scan, get the surgery scheduled, making sure that everything is as well functioning as possible. The next thing I'd like to talk about is what exactly is robotic assistance? So first, I'd like to tell you what it isn't. The robotics that we utilize here at Orthopedic Specialist with joint replacement does not replace the surgeon. Robotics is simply a tool that allows us to have the very best in precision and accuracy for how we put in the components around your knee replacement. It also allows us to give you a truly custom knee replacement based on your anatomy. So this is what it looks like as far as a little picture of the Mako robot itself. It is not something like the Terminator that runs around and doing surgery while I'm off someplace else enjoying my coffee. This is a tool that I use to give you a custom knee replacement with the utmost in precision and accuracy. The next thing I'd like to discuss with you is some basic anatomy. When you're coming through your visits, you may hear some terms and are not familiar with them. So, the first thing I'd like to say is the kneecap is called the patella. The thigh bone is called the femur. The shin bone is called the tibia. Now, there's lots of ligaments around the knee. The four most important ones that you may hear about, the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, and the one behind it here is the PCL, or posterior cruciate ligament. On the sides of our knees are the collateral ligaments, the lateral or outside collateral ligament, and the medial or inside collateral ligament. These ligamentous structures and the rest of the soft tissue on your knee are what we use to give you a custom knee replacement with robotics. Now, this blue area on the end of our thigh bone and our shin bone, that's the articular cartilage. This is the smooth surface that allows our bodies to have joints that glide with very, very low friction, lower than ice rubbing on ice, to give us painless range of motion. This is the area that gets worn out with arthritis. Now these two structures here are the menisci. This is the medial meniscus, this is the lateral meniscus. You may have had friends or family or even yourself that have had meniscal tears that were treated with a knee scope. These also get worn out through the arthritic process. And this is a little cartoon of what that looks like. When the articular cartilage gets used up and gone, your body forms all these bone spurs that we call osteophytes and the space gets narrowed because there's no cartilage. So, what exactly are our options for treating arthritis surgically? Well, there's two categories. There's the full or total knee replacement, or what is a partial knee replacement? Now to begin, not everyone is a candidate for a partial knee replacement. We basically have three compartments to our knee. We have the outside compartment called the lateral compartment, the inside compartment called the medial compartment, and then the kneecap or patellofemoral compartment. Partial knee replacements are designed for people that have a partial problem. Okay, This means that the whole knee isn't affected, such as what's in this cartoon. This would need a total knee replacement. If you have isolated disease in only one area of the knee, then you can have that treated with a partial knee replacement. So I like to say 
that a partial knee replacement is a total solution to a partial problem. So this right here is an example of a medial or inside partial knee. This is a lateral or outside partial knee. And this is a patellofemoral partial knee replacement. Now, the downsides to doing a partial knee replacement are that you can get arthritis that develops throughout the rest of your knee later on, causing it to fail. The plus sides are that it's less invasive, is that you don't have to redo the entire knee as you would with a total knee replacement. Now, this is what the cartoon looks like of a total knee replacement, and it involves three components. Again, the tibial, the femoral, and the patellar components. And then you have the plastic bushing between those to give it that bushing so that it's not metal on metal. Now, the benefits to a total knee replacement is that it treats the entire knee. The downsides are that it treats the entire knee and it's more work. You also have to sacrifice the ACL when you're doing a total knee replacement like this because this base plate here on the shin bone goes right and inserts where the ACL is. Now, there's also a big advantage in that most of the knee replacements that I do don't use bone cement. That is only available on the total knee option at this time. The partial knee replacements are still cemented, and that's another possible failure mode. Total knees typically have failed in the past because the shin bone would get loose. Now, with the press fit technology where the bone actually grows into this component, that will likely be a thing of the past. The partial knees do not have this option. Now, it used to be that with partial knee replacements, they would typically have a faster rehab and better range of motion because you're doing less work and you don't have to sacrifice all the ligaments. The plus sides for the robotics are that with when I look at the ligamentous structures and the other soft tissue around your knee, I can balance the metal components around your knee replacement in a truly custom manner and now the range of motion and rehab from a total knee replacement is basically the same as a partial knee. So there's a lot of advantages to a total knee replacement today compared to even five years ago. And a lot of those failure modes that we have for total knees aren't there as they were five years ago with the modern press fit technology. And this is a 3D printed titanium mesh on the knee replacement, so very, very advanced technology. Now as we go further in the reference book, there's another, we'll move down the frequently asked questions here. What are the results of a total knee replacement? Now, with robotic assistance, it has greatly improved. Classically, about four out of five patients were very happy with a knee replacement, and one out of five patients, which is about 20%, were not. Now, in my hands, it's much, much more improved, where it's greater than 95% of patients are very happy with knee replacement surgery. And that's because we can balance the knee in a custom fashion with the robotic technology. So we don't have that terrible outcomes that we used to have with a 20% failure rate. Now it's much, much more improved. What are the risks of knee replacement surgery? Most of the risks that we worry about today are related to medical complications. This focuses on the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the other organ systems in our body. So we work with your medical team, such as your primary care physician or your cardiologist or any other physician or team member that has input to get you, quote, cleared for surgery. So once the clearance has been done and you're at a low risk based on your health, the next risks that we worry about are infection, which is less than 1%. Chronic pain, which again has greatly improved with the custom knee replacements that we do here at Orthopedic Specialists for Robotics. The next risk we worry about is damage to tissues, blood vessels, or nerves around the knee. And again, with the modern techniques in robotics, this has been greatly reduced. And the last thing we worry about, which is probably the number one complication, is stiffness. Now I can guarantee you on the day of your knee replacement, your knee will fully straighten and fully bend in my hands, given the extreme accuracy and precision we have here at Orthopedic Specialists with the robotic technology. But the other half of this is that you have to keep that knee range of motion. And this is simply a function of moving it every day, every hour of that day. So I recommend to help fight stiffness, you have to be very, very aggressive on your physical therapy. 
and most of this is done at home on your own, but you will work with a physical therapist as well. So what I like to recommend for my patients is every hour of every day you start with three things, and this begins the day after surgery. Number one, you go for a short walk. This helps to warm up those leg muscles and get that knee ready for some physical therapy. On the day after your surgery, you start with just 50 feet per walk, which is roughly chair to your kitchen and back. This will help warm up your leg. And then each day after that, you increase a little bit on a baby step approach, doing more and more distance as your body allows you to do. The second thing you do is some range of motion physical therapy. And this sounds very simple because it basically involves pushing your knee fully straight and bending your knee as far as it will go. It sounds easy, but it is work. And we will help you with pain medications and other techniques to make this as easy as possible, but you still have to do the work. And it's important to tell you at this time, knee replacements unfortunately can hurt doing the rehab because you have to break up that scar tissue. Do not allow your knee to become stiff. This is a very preventable complication if you just work diligently and hard at keeping your knee moving and not allowing the scar tissue to form. And what you need to do is realize that I want my patients to have an A plus outcome, which means I need A plus effort. So an A plus outcome at six weeks is full range of motion, which is simply starting at zero and then bending to at least 120 degrees. And we will work with you to help this happen. The third thing that you can do is once you get enough range of motion to ride an exercise bike, that's a very easy way to get some range of motion and physical therapy on the knee by keeping it moving without putting much stress through it. And if you don't have an exercise bike, we can help you get a pedaler, which is sitting in a chair like this. You simply place it on the floor and pedal in front of you. Now, you will also work with a physical therapist for the first six weeks, typically two to three times per week, and they will function as a coach to help you fight stiffness. Next, should I exercise before the surgery? The answer is yes. Exercise is excellent for maintaining your range of motion of your knee as much as possible and also building up those leg muscles so that they're ready to work after surgery. So conditioning or pre-rehabilitation before surgery is extremely important. How long will I be incapacitated? You won't be incapacitated at all. I want you walking on your knee replacement the day of your surgery. That is very important. Again, don't feel like you are incapacitated. Use the walking aids such as a walker or a cane and get up and move on your knee replacement immediately. How long will I be at the surgery center or the hospital? The great news is with the modern advances that we've done with the minimally invasive approaches such as robotic assistance and the other techniques that we use here at orthopedic specialists, Many of these surgeries can be done as an outpatient, meaning that you're discharged on the same day of your surgery. About 70% of my joint replacement patients can go home safely on the day of their surgery. My average length of stay when you're discharged on the same day is about six hours after leaving the operating room. For the remainder of those patients, most of them can be discharged after a single night in the hospital or the surgery center. What if I live alone? If you live alone, it's not a requirement that you have to go to a rehab facility. You can go back home even if you live alone. We usually try to recommend that you have someone help you for the first two or three nights after your surgery just in case something would arise, but it's not an absolute. Also, as I previously mentioned, I want you walking on your knee replacement. So if you do have someone helping you out at home, please do not let them do everything for you. Get up every hour as part of your therapy, and you can incorporate this into getting your pain medications. You can get your own water, you can get your own sandwich, you can get your slippers or any other object and make this part of your therapy. Get up and move on your knee replacement. How do I arrange for surgery? Well, luckily here at Orthopedic Specialists, we have a whole surgical team available and ready to help you navigate this process. Once you make the decision that a knee replacement is right for you, our surgery schedules will help you and work with you to get this process done. So basically, just sit back and allow us to help you with the work. How long does the surgery take? Well, even if you're getting discharged same day, this is a pretty much an all-day affair for you. You have to get to the surgery center or the hospital roughly two hours before your surgery, 
and then once you leave the operating room, it's typically six hours or so until you're discharged home. Now, the actual surgical time itself, from when we make the incision to close the incision, is anywhere from 45 minutes to one and a half hours. Will I require general anesthesia? The answer is most likely no. The anesthesia providers here at the surgery center and at the hospital predominantly do what's called a regional anesthetic, which is a spinal block that basically from the belly button down makes your legs go numb. This lasts on average about two to three hours, and then we do IV or intravenous sedation to make you go to sleep at the time of your surgery. So you will not be awake for your surgery, but you do not have to have a breathing tube most likely, and you'll be breathing on your own. However, if you've had previous back surgery, or you have severe scoliosis, or some kind of arthritis in your back that prevents that spinal anesthetic from getting delivered, then you would have to have the general anesthesia with the breathing tube. That happens less than 5% of the time. What will my pain be like after knee replacement surgery? Unfortunately, knee replacement surgery can have a significant amount of pain associated with it. We will help you as much as possible with the techniques that we'll go through later on in the reference guide to make this as easy and as painless as possible, but you still have to do your physical therapy even if it hurts. I tell people this is a tough love. It's a war of attrition. Do not let your knee get stiff. You have to do your physical therapy every day every hour of every day while you're awake. Who will be performing the surgery? I will. Here at Orthopedic Specialists, we have a whole surgical staff and team that assist us in surgery, but Dr. Robert Cagle is your surgeon. He will be performing the procedure. We have assistants and robotics that assist myself in surgery, but I will be performing your surgery. Will I need a walker or crutches? <clears throat> the answer is yes. I usually do not recommend crutches because they can help limit your weight bearing. Walkers are much better because you can put full weight on that knee, but you have stability for your arms just in case you're feeling like your knee may buckle or if it's painful to give your arms some ability to support yourself. The question is how long will you need this? I tell people you need the walker as long as you need the walker. This is not a race. Take the time you need to have a safe outcome. The main rule I have regarding this is you're not allowed to fall down. Stay vertical. So if after one week you feel like you do not need it, then you don't have to use it. However, many patients feel more comfortable using walkers for several weeks. For me, you need the walker as long as you need the walker. You can transition to the cane when you feel like you no longer need the walker, or you can transition to nothing if you feel like that's absolutely right for you. Just you're not allowed to fall. Will I need someone with me all the time when I go home? The answer is no. For the first few days after surgery, it's helpful to have someone there to assist you. But again, I want you walking on this every hour of each day. Get up and get your own water, juice, food, pain medications, etc. and you can take care of yourself but it is nice to have someone there for support and to help you if needed. Will I need physical therapy when I go home? This is a definite yes. As I said before, knee replacement surgery, rehabilitation, is a tough love. You have got to push hard on your knee in physical therapy, meaning you get it fully straight every hour of each day and you bend it as much as possible each day. Physical therapists you will work with are typically two to three times per week for the first six weeks. They will help function as a coach to make sure you stay on track and are doing well with your rehab process. Now again, at one week from surgery to get an A+, I want to see at least a right angle or 90 degrees out of your knee replacement and most importantly the ability to fully straighten your knee and in six weeks I want to see 120 degrees at a minimum which is full range of motion. So by six weeks, an A-plus is full range of motion from fully straight to fully bent, and we will help you do this. So if you think about it, if you get 90 degrees by week one and 120 degrees by week six, you have to make less than one degree per day of progress to get that A-plus. But it's every day. It's baby steps, as I say. Baby step approach, increasing a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit each day that's how it's manageable. 
When will I be able to return to work? This is a difficult question to answer. It depends. So if you have predominantly a sit-down job, at the computer screen, answering phones, or something that's not labor intensive, and you don't require a lot of standing or walking, you can go back to work when you feel comfortable. I've had patients that have literally taken a weekend off and gone back to work. I've had other patients that took two weeks off and went back to work. However, if you have a labor intensive job or a job that requires standing or walking a large amount of time, I recommend a minimum of six weeks off. You want to focus on your rehabilitation of your knee replacement. Do not allow it to get stiff. So please take the time to do the physical therapy as needed. How often will I need to see my doctor following the surgery? I like to see my patients at a minimum at one week from surgery and at six weeks from surgery and at one year from surgery. If you're having issues or would like to see me any other time points than that, that is fine. I'm here for you to help you with this process. But when it's absolutely necessary for you to come in, it's one week, six weeks, and one year. Will I have restrictions following my surgery? The answer is yes. You can put full weight on it. You can do almost all activities of daily life and exercises as you see fit. However, running and jumping and repetitive pounding type activities that involve running and jumping, I usually don't recommend because I don't want them to wear out the parts too soon. So, going back to a fitness schedule of hiking or cycling or swimming is fine, but getting back to jogging, not so fine. Also, sports such as pickleball or doubles tennis are fine, but if you want to go back to volleyball or basketball or soccer, these involve running and jumping, so they are not fine. But swimming, hiking, cycling, these are all fine activities to get back to. What physical recreational activities may I participate in after my recovery? So, as I previously mentioned, if it involves running and jumping, these are usually permanent restrictions. However, for the first 6 to 12 weeks after surgery, you want to avoid physical activities or recreational activities that may make your knee swell or put undue stress on it and that will hurt your physical rehabilitation after surgery. Get your range of motion and get it by 6 weeks. So if you're doing activities that make your knee swollen and painful and it's difficult for you to participate in your physical therapy, then that's not a good idea. So typically as a rule of thumb when it comes to exercise, upper body workouts are fine as long as you can handle them and they don't stress your system out. To get to exercise on the lower extremities, such as weightlifting or resistance training of any kind, I usually recommend for at least six weeks and usually 12 weeks a graduated approach to get back to this. So for six weeks, nothing. Focus on your range of motion. And after six weeks, if you're still not at full range of motion, do not get back into a strength building regimen yet. Focus on your range of motion. If you get all of your range of motion by six weeks, then you can gradually start building an exercise routine back into your legs with the goal by three months or 12 weeks, you're back to an exercise program involving your legs. So again, Get your range of motion first, and then work on working out on your legs second. How long until I can drive after surgery? Excellent question. The most important thing after surgery is to maintain that you're safe behind the wheel. I would hate to hear of you injuring someone or yourself because you couldn't control your vehicle. So with the left leg, it's typically easier than the right leg because most of us today have automatic transmissions and we don't have a clutch. But the brake pedal is extremely important. With reckless driving, if you cannot stomp the brake to avoid an accident, you are driving recklessly. And I usually recommend for the right leg, plan your life around six weeks, just in case it takes that long for you to feel comfortable to be able to quickly and with strength stomp the brake pedal. If it comes back by two weeks and you feel confident, then you can drive it two weeks, but you plan for six just in case. Now with the left leg, as long as you have an automatic transmission, it's when you feel comfortable that you aren't driving recklessly. Now the second thing to talk about when returning back to driving is you can't drive under the influence. This involves the narcotic medications. So if you're on narcotics, you cannot drive. It is illegal to drive under the influence of narcotics. So number one, you can't drive recklessly. Number two, you can't drive under the influence.
When can I resume sexual activity? I don't give you any restrictions on sexual activity immediately after surgery. It's when you feel well enough to be able to enjoy this activity. The one thing I do say is you can't put anything directly on the incision itself on your knee. So please keep it clean and dry and you can resume this activity when you see fit. Will I need post-operative equipment? The answer is yes. You'll need a walker, you'll need what's called an incentive spirometer, and you'll also need sequential compression devices. We will get to this later on in the reference guide. Will I be eligible for a temporary disability placard? The answer is yes. At your preoperative visit with my team, if you are interested in this, please let us know and we can give you a prescription to go and pick up a disability placard at the DMV. Will I need a special card for flying? The answer is no. If you go through the metal detector or the scanner at the airport, it may go off. If this happens, just let them know you had a knee replacement. They will likely have to wand you down and pat your leg and explain to them that you had a knee replacement, and then they will let you on your way. And on that note, when it comes to travel, for the first six weeks after surgery, please try to refrain from travel if necessary. The one risk I will let leave till future in the reference guide is blood clot risk. We will talk about this in detail moving forward but traveling in the first six weeks after surgery does increase your risk of a blood clot after having knee replacement. So this concludes the frequently asked questions part of the book. Now we'll move, how do we get prepared for surgery? So please read this entire section and we will go through now the preoperative checklist. So before you contemplate having surgery, I recommend that you talk to your medical care team to make sure that you are of enough health to be able to tolerate the surgery itself and then also the physical therapy that's required after having a knee replacement. This will likely involve any kind of laboratory testing that your primary care doctor needs or some kind of look at your heart such as an EKG or an echocardiogram. I will help you as much as possible with this, but I will rely on your medical team to quote get you cleared for surgery and preoperative exercises. Again, as we talked about previously, make sure that you have as much strength and flexibility as possible in your knee at the time of surgery. This will make your rehab easier if you're starting out stronger. Now, before surgery, it's also important to note if you use nicotine products, these need to be stopped two months before surgery. Nicotine is a powerful drug that hurts blood vessels. This increases your infection risk and it makes it harder for the wounds to heal. So for two months before surgery and two months after surgery, I ask that you refrain from any nicotine use. Smoking, gums, patches, chews, snuffs, cigars, anything of the sort must be stopped two months before surgery. And we typically test this to make sure that you're gonna have the best possible outcome. So, four weeks before surgery, checklist. Again, stop smoking. We will cancel your surgery if we're worried that you're not going to follow this rule. The next thing is on the back of this reference guide there's an anesthesia appendix. Please read this at this time as you will need to be informed as to what your anesthetic options are. Now in the week before surgery, this is typically when you're going to have your preoperative visit with me or my medical team. We will go through this book and answer questions you may have after watching this video so please read the book and please watch this video to make sure that you're informed as possible to make this as easy as possible at your preoperative checkpoint. One week before surgery, you need to stop any medications that can increase your bleeding. These are blood thinners such as Coumadin or Warfarin or Eliquis or Xarelto. This also includes anti-inflammatory medications that you may be taking for your pain such as Ibuprofen, Aleve, or even the prescription varieties such as Celebrex or Mobic. These all increase your blood, your blood loss at the time of surgery, so please stop this one week beforehand. If you're on these medications as directed by a cardiologist or your primary care physician, we will need to work with them to bridge you in between stopping these medications and resuming them the day after your surgery. Now, the day before your surgery, most important, find out when you need to arrive. Typically, two hours is what you need to arrive at the surgery center or the hospital before your scheduled OR start time. So if you're starting at 7.30 in the morning, you need to be there at 5.30 in the morning. Now the night before surgery, 
You need to not eat after midnight or drink after midnight. You also need to start with the protocol of cleaning off your knee site with the antibacterial soap. Typically the night before and the morning of surgery, you need to wash this area. We will do this again when you get to the surgery center or the hospital and one final time before we make incision. Day of surgery. Again, your arrival time is typically two hours before your scheduled surgical start time, so please be on time. What to wear. Please wear loose-fitting clothing. This is not a fashion show or beauty contest. Make this as easy as possible. Sweatshirts and sweatpants are appropriate and actually recommended for coming to the surgery suite. What to bring with you. Please bring a copy of any advanced directives. Please bring a copy of your insurance card, your driver's license, or other form of identification. And bring your walker with you. What to not bring. Please don't bring a lot of valuables or large amounts of cash to the surgical suite. We don't want to be responsible or have this get lost. Please don't bring any makeup with you. Again, not a fashion show. We like you just the way you are, so come in loose fitting clothing without a lot of makeup. Now, what happens the day of your surgery? When you arrive two hours before your scheduled start time, you'll meet the nursing staff that will be helping you. They'll get you in a hospital gown, again, wash off your knee, and start the IV so that way you can start beginning the medications you'll need for your surgery. Then you get ready for the operating room, and this is where your surgery happens. Now, after my job is done and your knee replacement has been performed, then you're going to go to the recovery room. The recovery room is typically where you're going to be for the next six hours after surgery. Once the block has worn off and your legs are back functioning, you'll get up and work with physical therapy. The nursing staff will there be there to help you with any pain medications, help you with food and drink, and getting back to being stable after having anesthesia and your knee replacement. And if you're going home same day, typically you'll be discharged from the recovery room. If you need to stay the night, and typically you'll be transferred to one of our overnight rooms at the surgery center or at the hospital. Now, after leaving, these are copies here of the equipment that you will be needing after surgery. This is what the front wheeled walker looks like after surgery. This is what an incentive spirometer looks like. This is a machine that you'll breathe through to help clean out any fluid in your lungs to prevent getting pneumonia or other complications related to this buildup. This needs to be done 10 times per hour or roughly every six minutes of a single breath. The next item you'll need is what's called an SCD or a sequential compression device. These are worn around your legs to again decrease the risk of blood clots. These are used at night while you're sleeping or if you're at rest and not moving. You can take them off while you're doing your physical therapy or if you're walking around. Now caring for yourself at home. Make sure that you have any kind of trip hazards for the walker or yourself gone. Rolled up rugs, electrical cords, or frayed, tattered rugs can be trip hazards. Also furniture that's in the way, please get your home ready for your arrival. Temperature. A lot of people can get fevers after having a knee replacement. This usually isn't related to infection. It's usually related to coming off the anesthetic and having the buildup in your lungs. So by doing good pulmonary hygiene, it's called by using this incentive spirometer greatly reduces that risk. Now, controlling your discomfort. Again, unfortunately knee replacement surgery can be painful, but you still need to do your physical therapy. Now how can we make this as minimal as possible? Number one, try to minimize the swelling. The swelling is going to peak around day five, six, or seven. The inflammatory response makes swelling. And how do you control that? The best thing to start with is ice. An ice machine is an excellent way to try to control the swelling around your knee. We have these available here at Orthopedic Specialists for you. Unfortunately, insurance companies don't provide for them as they consider them a luxury item, but I highly recommend them as your knee replacement will go much smoother if you use one of these to keep the swelling down. The second thing you can do other than cool, keeping it cooled off is by keeping it compressed. The ACE bandage that you wake up with on your knee is a compression device to try to control the amount of swelling as well. I recommend that you keep the ACE wrap on your knee for the first week after surgery. We will go into this in more detail during the wound management portion of the reference guide. 
The last thing to talk about with controlling your symptoms is medications. Now, before we start talking about the pain medications, it's important to talk about blood clot risk again. So here, there are two medication levels that we have. Aspirin is for standard risk. Eliquis is what we use for high risk. The four questions we need to answer is number one, have you ever had a blood clot in the past? This is a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, or a PE, a pulmonary embolus. This is what we're trying to avoid. If you have a history of this, this makes you a high risk candidate. The second question is does a direct family member, such as a brother, a father, sister, etc., have a history of a blood clot? The third question is in yourself if you have any history of systemic cancer. If you have a cancer history, this can increase your risk of a blood clot. The fourth question is are you on any kind of hormone replacement? Some of the hormone replacement therapies out there can increase your risk of blood clots. Answering yes to one or more of these questions places you in the high risk category and you will take Eliquis, two and a half milligrams, every 12 hours for one month. If you're in the standard risk, then you take a baby aspirin, which is 81 milligrams, every 12 hours for one month. Now, pain control. I believe in multimodal pain control as it comes to medications, meaning that you take several medications to try to limit the amount of narcotics you're going to need. So the first two medications here, Celebrex is an anti-inflammatory. You take this every 12 hours, just following the bottle description. Tylenol, 1,000 milligrams every 8 hours is two extra strength tablets every 8 hours. These two medications are where you start with a mild level of pain. Now, immediately after surgery, it's probably going to be more than just mild. Oxycodone is the narcotic medication. This medication is strong and is for severe level pain. You add this medication to these first two, so you're taking a total of three medications for your pain now. This can be taken two pills every four hours at a maximum. You take this in conjunction with the Tylenol and the Celebrex. Now, if this is too much for you and your pain isn't quite severe, it's more of a moderate category, then you would not take oxycodone. You would take Ultram, or the generic name is Tramadol, every six hours, 50 milligrams. And you would take that in conjunction with these two. So you start with the mild pain medications and you add the Ultram if it's moderate or you add the oxycodone if it's severe. The next medication to talk about is the anti-nausea. A side effect of taking pain medications or anesthesia can be nausea in your stomach. So Zofran, eight milligrams every six hours as needed. If you do not need this medication, you do not have to take it. Now, postoperative anemia. You will lose a little bit of blood at the time of your surgery. So if you're not on a multivitamin that it contains these supplements, I recommend that for one month after surgery, you take an iron supplement and a folic acid supplement to help you rebuild your blood count. The last medication class is for constipation. This is the kind of side effect from the pain pills and anesthesia that we want to try to avoid. So I recommend you start treating it before you get it. The two things that we start with, Senecot, two tablets before bedtime, and Miralax, one capful or a packet, depending on how the pharmacy dispenses it to you, in a glass of water or juice, starting the day of your surgery. And you would take this while you're on the pain medications. The other things that I want you doing is, if you read this, is stay hydrated, drink plenty of fluids. Keeping plenty of fluids on board will help keep your stool soft and readily mobile through your track. Also, you can supplement with prune juice or high fiber containing foods. If all this isn't working, please call us here at Orthopedic Specialists. We have other things that we can help you with to help get this problem resolved. But treating it before you get it usually avoids it in most patients. Now, on the rest of these pages here throughout are some basic body changes that I want you to really read on your own. I want to focus now on the care and appearance of your knee replacement. And the first thing that we need to talk about in detail is the wound management. It's very important that you follow these instructions carefully. So when you wake up from surgery, you will have a large fluffy dressing over your knee replacement. This involves first the ACE wrap, which is the compression device around your knee. Underneath that will be all the fluffy gauze padding. And underneath that will be a super glue based dressing called Prinio. Now this Prinio is supposedly waterproof 
but just in case it's not, I usually recommend that you wait three days after surgery to begin showering, just in case. So, for three days after your surgery, do not remove the dressing at all. On day three after surgery, when you're ready to begin showering, you simply unwrap the ace bandage, you peel all the fluffy gauze away, but you leave the strip of super glue alone over the incision. You get in the shower, do not apply anything directly to the wound. No creams, no lo soaps, no lotions, no salves. You just leave it alone and let the soapy water run down your leg. When you're done in the shower, you simply pat it dry and then reapply the ace bandage. So you do not need any more fluffy gauze, but I want the compression on your knee for one week. This will help to control the swelling as we talked about. And then on top of the ace bandage, you put that bladder from the cryotherapy unit to help keep the swelling to a minimum. And I recommend to use this for one week, at least. So this is used 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off, but you leave the bladder on. So there's a machine that has the switch on it. You keep the ice water filled in the machine and you leave the, the bladder on, running it in 30 minute cycles of on then off all day while you're awake. You do this for the first week. So again, compress it with the ace bandage and keep it cold with the cryo unit in 30 minute intervals. After the first week, if you want to wear the ace wrap longer, that's fine. If you want to use the cryo unit longer, that's fine. But for at least one week, please do these two modalities to help keep the swelling to a minimum. Now, the perineal dressing. I said that stays on after you remove all the fluffy gauze. This stays on for 21 days or three weeks. So when you have your first visit with me after surgery, this will stay on. Now, when 21 days after surgery goes by, I recommend you take it off yourself after taking a warm shower. This will help loosen it from the skin. And then, after it's removed, you do not need any further dressing care for the incision. But, I still want you to not go underwater or apply anything directly to the wound. So showering is okay after day three, but no submerging underwater in a swimming pool or a hot tub or anything of that nature for four weeks. So once the super glue dressing is removed at three weeks, you watch the incision for one more week, and if at four weeks everything looks good, now there are no restrictions and this is the end of the wound care. You can apply anything you want to the incision, such as lotions or creams or anti-scar modalities, and you can get it wet underwater in a swimming pool or a hot tub. Next page, recognizing potential complications. So the number one that I'm worried about is an infection. This is extremely low risk of less than 1%, and the best thing you can do is read this instruction manual carefully in the reference guide in regards to the wound care and appearance of your knee. Leave the dressing intact, as we just previously mentioned, and follow those instructions. The next thing that we can do is by giving you antibiotics around procedures such as dental work or colonoscopies, as this can deliver through the bloodstream infections. The last thing that we do is by doing good work at the time of surgery, giving you antibiotics around surgery itself and cleaning you off several times as we previously mentioned with the antibacterial soaps. Now the signs and symptoms of infection are drainage or any kind of swelling or redness that is out of the ordinary. So for the first week after surgery, I expect your knee to be hot and red and swollen and painful. That is all normal. But having any kind of drainage, I want to know about. And if you notice that your pain gets better and then suddenly it's getting worse, please let us know. Obviously fevers or chills, let us know. And I recommend that on page 21, read carefully how to prevent infections. Okay. The next complication that we want to watch out for is blood clots. So number one, move frequently. Every hour of every day while you're awake, do your physical therapy. Not only is this great for your knee, but it also circulates that blood in your legs to try to prevent this terrible complication of a blood clot. The signs and symptoms of the legs. Swelling that is worse on one side than the other. Now, I expect your knee to be swollen after surgery, and this can go all the way down to your foot and ankle. But if you notice that it's getting worse and worse and worse, please let us know. The other thing can be swelling in your calf or pain in your calf with stretching. Please let us know. Now, how to prevent it? Again, move frequently, 
And number two, take the medications that we go through previously, either the aspirin or the Eliquis to help prevent blood clots. And again, pulmonary embolus prevented the same way that we prevent the DVT. That is where the DVT blood clot can break off and go to the lungs. Take the medications and move frequently. The next page on 23, post-operative activity guidelines. Again, physical therapy after knee replacement is critical for a good outcome. These are some examples through these pages here of examples of the knee replacement exercises that I want you doing. Now you'll likely need to do much more than just these working with your physical therapist, but this is at least a place to start after surgery and giving you a brief reference guide to go off of just in case. Page 25, precautions and tips after having knee replacement surgery. The moral, page 25, precautions and home safety tips. Now, the overall rule of thumb for this is try to prevent complications rather than treat them. So, before surgery, get your home ready for your arrival after surgery. In regards to the kitchen, get all your shopping done. Try to make as much food as possible beforehand. Try to eliminate any variables that can make it hard for you to function after having surgery. In the bathroom, please get it ready. Having a raised toilet seat can be very helpful. Get any kind of debris out of the tub. Get all of your cleaning done before your surgery. Get your house in order. Safety and avoiding falls. Most important, if you need to use the walker, please do so. And this involves getting your house ready for a walker. Again, any kind of electrical cords or rugs or carpeting that's damaged that prevents a fall risk, you should try to get taken care of. Any furniture that may be blocking your pathway, get out of the way. Get your house ready for the walker and please use it. Stairs and getting in and out of bed. Again, I want you putting full weight on your operative knee. Your knee replacement can put full weight on it again. But if you want to go up and down stairs, it's beneficial to single leg each step, each step, each step to make it easy and prevent a fall. And most people with steps prefer to plan their day around only going up and down the stairs once. So it's not required that you live on your main floor and get an extra bed, but if you'd like to do so, that's fine. Also, plan your day around this. If you want to have your day planned with several trips up and down the stairs, that will make it harder on you. So just plan accordingly. What to do for exercise during your recovery. Again, going back to the physical therapy, for the first 6 to 12 weeks after having a knee replacement, please be very cautious about doing any kind of exercise activities on your legs. The upper body is fine as long as it doesn't interfere with your legs or cause you to have problems. But get your range of motion first before you think about exercise. And then once that happens, you can start getting back into your exercise regimen as long as your knee tolerates it. Listen to your body and don't overdo it. Simply increase your activities on a baby step approach where each day you're doing more and more and more and more. That way if you do have an overdo it, it's only a small amount and it doesn't set you back too much. What not to do for exercise is doing your recovery. Again, permanently after surgery, no running or jumping. Second, anything that involves exercise on the lower legs is usually not accepted after surgery as it can make your knee get swollen, which will then hurt your range of motion as you're trying to get it. So running or jumping or any kind of strenuous activities that make your knee swell, you need to avoid. Now, starting with page 27, we get to the appendices portion. The first appendix to read is what are exactly your options for living wills or advanced directives. I recommend you have this discussion with your family and friends before surgery and bring this with you to the surgery suite at the surgery center or at the hospital. And this is simply a list that goes over your options. On page 28, the anesthesia and you appendix begins. Again, please read this several times. You will meet your anesthesia provider on the day of your surgery, and if you have questions, this will help you be prepared to ask the appropriate questions and get them answered. That way you feel comfortable and ready for your knee replacement. And this continues on page 29. 
on page 30. The last appendix, some techniques and methods for relaxation after surgery. It's important that you are in good health both mentally and physically after your knee replacement. And these are some techniques that can help make this process as simple as possible. And this continues on page 31. And this concludes, and this concludes our reference guide to knee replacement surgery. Again, I'm Dr. Robert Cagle, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video going through the reference guide for your upcoming knee replacement. I'd also like to thank you for trusting myself here at Orthopedic Specialists with your care coming up for your knee replacement surgery. Thank you again, and have a great day.